Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. So as I'm recording this, I recently was reading an article by Clive Thompson on the effect that the COVID pandemic has had on education. And the fact, of course, there was a whole thing where students go to school for a while, couldn't go to school for a while and people had to learn remotely. But what about not university students, but lower levels, high school and uh, secondary school students? Well, it turns out the effect of the pandemic was bad on education here in the United States, uh, for sure. And that's maybe not surprising. You know, a lot of the resources, a lot of the usual ways that we did things just weren't available. Even if we could have found ways that were just as good, it takes time to do that. And so certain students are really hurt by that. But interestingly, the decline in scores, which is sort of across the board, is much higher in math than it is in reading. So for whatever reason there was a much bigger deleterious effect of homeschooling on kids trying to learn math than kids trying to learn reading. And why is that? And in the essay, tries to argue that it's basically because when you're at home and you're trying to learn math, you're going to learn it from your parents, and chances are good that your parents hate math, <laughs> because a lot of people hate math. It's, it's considered okay to hate math, to say, oh, I'm not so good at math, I don't really understand that stuff, it's too hard, in a way that it's not considered okay to hate reading or, or history or other forms forms of knowledge. And that's a weird thing, and it's probably a bad thing. And one of the people in the world who's done the most to combat this feeling is today's guest, John Allen Palos. Uh, famously, he's the author of Innumeracy, Mathematical Illiteracy and Its Consequences. That's back in 1988. Uh, but he's a mathematician at Temple University, and he's kept up this fight to get people to overcome their innumeracy, their mathematical illiteracy, and to learn more, to be more comfortable learning math, including in a brand new book called Who's Counting? Uniting Numbers and Narratives with Stories from Pop Culture, Puzzles, Politics, and More. In the podcast, we're going to talk a little bit about math, but largely, in some sense, we're talking about the relationship between ordinary people and math. What is the math that people should know? How should we teach it to them? Uh, why don't they want to learn it? Why, why is it so frightening? Is it, is it their fault? Is it our fault for how we teach it? How could we do better? Uh, but then we also do talk a little bit about the, the substance of math, because it's not just that we need to teach math and need to get better at it, but what kinds of math should we teach? And I think that there's a thing that is said over and over again in, in my circles that uh, we actually don't spend nearly enough time teaching probability and statistics uh, to people of all sorts of backgrounds, whether you're going to be a professional scientist or whether you're just going to be uh, doing anything else in the world. There's a knowledge of probability that is very, very helpful that somehow we do not successfully convey to people in the educational system. So we talk a little bit about conditional probabilities and how you can get an intuition for things like that and, and why math works at all and how it can be uh, conveyed using jokes and humor, which makes everything a little bit better. So I think this is kind of an important topic. I'm not sure that we solved it once and for all, but paying attention to it is one step in the right direction. Occasional reminder that here at Mindscape, we have a Patreon feed. Go to patreon.com slash Sean M. Carroll, and you can get both ad-free episodes and the ability to contribute to the Ask Me Anything questions that we have. And yet another uh, occasional reminder that we have the Mindscape Big Picture Scholarship. It's been going very, very well, I think, we're going to be able to give out three college scholarships this year of $10,000 each. So if you go to bold.org slash scholarships slash Mindscape, you can either contribute to it if you're at that stage of your life or apply for it if you're at that stage of your life. So I'm looking forward to seeing what the winners are going to be and what great things they're going to do. And with that, let's go. John Allen Polos, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. It's a pleasure to be here, Sean. So you've, in some sense, maybe tell me if this is fair or not, but in some sense you've devoted your life to fighting against innumeracy, or maybe you want to say to promoting numeracy. You wrote a, a wonderful book with the title Innumeracy. 
How do you yourself define numeracy or enumeracy? Uh, I think enumeracy is just the ability to deal reasonably well with uh, numbers, probabilities, logic. Uh, so there's no hard and fast uh, precise definition, but uh, uh, and then numeracy, of course, uh, is uh, an inability to deal with basic numbers, basic probability, basic logic. I mean, and uh, again, it's uh, it's I, yeah, one one of the points I like to make over again is the dubiousness of uh, <laughs> precision, and uh, so I, I, you know, people are very precise, and the, the precision is unwarranted. So. Um, that's my defense for not giving a more precise definition of numeracy. No, that's completely fair, I think. I guess the reason why I'm wondering is because I'm thinking about literacy, which is the obvious comparison. Right. And in some sense, literacy is more of a yes-no question. You know, some people have bigger vocabularies than others, but but you read or you don't. Whereas when it comes to math, there's just seems to be a continuum. Like, I, I know a lot of math. I've, I've learned a lot. I use it all the time. I still feel that there's enormously more math than I don't know <laughs> than what I know. <laughs> well, I think that to some extent that's still the case with, uh, with literacy. I mean, people who can, you know, read the newspaper, you give them a, a book by, you know, I don't know, Heidegger. Yeah. Uh, or even even a normal person reading a book by Heidegger uh, <laughs> would uh, it would be uh, baffled. Uh, so there is kind of a continuum, although it's a, a little bit more binary with literacy than it is with numeracy. And I think that, uh, but there are different kinds of mathematical knowledge. And I think that maybe some people who are not into the world of math maybe don't appreciate what mathematicians do for a living versus calculating you know like what i do I, i'm no better at calculating a tip or doing my taxes than anybody else is i don't know about you yeah no it's the same <laughs> no, so what well, is, that, that, sorry what so, so what is <laughs> how do you think about that difference how do you think about math as opposed to just multiplying and dividing well i mean uh, one point i've made in a couple of my books is that uh math is much greater than computation. That's most people's kind of myopic view of it. But math, math is to uh, computation as literature is to typing. Mm -hmm. Nobody says, uh, you're a great typist. Why don't you write a novel or converse? <laughs> and um, so, you know, th th that's why one of the uh, obstacles to uh, in teaching math, people think they know it already. I know how to multiply. I know how to plug formulas into... Uh, numbers into formulas is there something more but there's a lot more i mean patterns logic uh you know, structure of various sorts and it uh you know it maps onto everyday events often enough that uh it's it's worth uh, knowing uh, even if you're not going to be a mathematician even among mathematicians i find that um, people who are analysts often don't understand some what I think is an obvious point in probability of statistics. <laughs> or people who are in in algebraic topology don't necessarily understand much about Fanox spaces. And uh, yeah, but that's the case in a lot of things. I mean, my 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 son's a lawyer, and uh, you know, whenever uh, my wife or I have a question, we know not to ask him because he's a very good lawyer. He makes a lot of money, but he only knows what he knows. Right? Yeah, it's specialized. And, uh, let me let me so, just let's get some examples on the table so people have an idea of what, what we're talking about in the book. Like right right at the beginning, you say the following thing. If at least one of a woman's two children is a boy born in summer, the probability she has two boys is seven fifteenths. <laughs> uh, right. That's well, let me back up. The, if the, the probability a woman has two sons if the uh given, well, again, probability two sons given she's got at least one son, that's one third because you can't have a uh, girl girl. So probability two boys given at least one boy is one third. The probability of uh, uh, two boys given at least one boy born in the summer is seven fifteenths, which is, <laughs> which is <laughs> close to a half. So it's uh, the, the more precise you are about, I mean, you can set up the sample space and uh, convince yourself, but the more precise, precise you are about uh, the, the boy she does have, if it has two boys, at least one of whom is born on July 4th, uh, then the probability is almost a half. 
So the more, I mean, it, it, it's hard without writing out the sample space, but right. it, it's uh, typical of uh, problems, in, many problems in probability. They're counterintuitive. That's one reason people have problems with uh, probability. Their they're, they're probabilistic vocabulary is limited to one in a million, maybe, or 50-50, or sure thing. And uh, on top of that, they, people don't think naturally in terms of uh, probability. And many people, oh, everything has a reason. And uh, and the fact that uh, propositions like you just mentioned are, are counterintuitive. The, the most famous example is the birthday uh, puzzle. You know, 23 people is sufficient for, uh, if you have 23 people in the room, it, uh, probability is uh, one half that at least two have the same birthday. Well, that's why I wanted to discuss this example in particular, because the, I mean, the number 7 fifteenths is maybe not, you know, I don't really care what that number is. This is not yeah, going to come right, up yeah. very often, but it's, <laughs> an, it's an example of conditional probability of, you know, probability of one thing and how it changes given some extra information. I mean, is, is that something that people struggle with, especially in your experience? Uh, yeah, uh, conditional probability, revising one's uh, probabil probability estimates is something we do in everyday life. The only thing is, in, if you study probability or Bayes' rule in particular, you, you can refine it. So all, everything we do in probability, in a sense, are refinements of notions that develop naturally. I mean, the, the notion of uh, uh, mean, median, and mode, or central tendency, there are all kinds of words in English or other natural languages, a average, so-so, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever, a, a complex of words that essentially mean 50-50 or of the mean, average, the same thing with variance. There's all kinds of words in English that uh, other natural languages too, far out, uh, disparate, <laughs> very different. <laughs> far out is uh, interesting because it's far out on a distribution. And the uh, same thing with, with uh, probability. I mean, as Moliere commented, uh, people generally have been... Uh, you know, speaking prose all their life, and they're generally been speaking probability all their life. It's just that they speak with a very bad accent. Mm. I mean, a, a, a simple example in Bayes' theorem, if you have two coins and one of them is two-headed and one of them is fair, you don't know which is which, you pick one up and flip it three times, you get three heads in a row. And he, you know, it's common sense to say, well, it's very likely, or more likely that you pick the two-headed coin, but but only Bayes' theorem says that that probability rises from one half to eight ninths. So, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, probability statistics are refinements or distillations of kind of hazy, nebulous, uh, everyday uh, notions. Well, the classic example of this that uh, roiled, I guess it wasn't the Internet, it seemed before the Internet was around, but the Monty Hall problem got people very right. worked up, right? Uh, why don't you remind us of what the Monty Hall problem is? Because maybe there's still people out there who've never heard of it. Yeah, there are, actually, in my, at least in my experience. The Monty Hall problem has to do with uh, a TV show a number of years ago, uh, Let's Make a Deal, in which there's a host and a guest and uh, three doors behind one of which is a car. And the host asks the guest to choose the door behind which he hopes is a new car. And if he's correct, he gets a new car. So let's say uh, the guest picks door one. Then the host, who knows where the car is, always opens one of the one of the other doors where he's where it's certain that there's no car. So he always opens a, a door behind which there's nothing. And then he asks, he says to the guest, you, are you sure you don't want to switch uh, from one to two? Let's say he opens door three. You sure you don't want to switch from one to two? You, you chose door one. I've opened door three. You want to switch your, your bet uh, to two. And uh, often people say, no, it doesn't make any difference. There's two doors open. Chances are 50-50, uh, one half. That I might as well stay here. Yeah. But he should switch. Because the probability he was right the first time is one third. The probability uh, the car is behind one of the other two doors is two thirds. But since uh, the host opens door three, that two thirds probability is now focused on the unopened door. So were he to switch, he would raise his probability of winning the car from one third to two thirds. But um, many people, including them, there's a 
story that may be apocryphal, but the great uh, Paul Erdos, a mathematician, was supposedly baffled by this. I find that I find, <laughs> I find that hard it hard to believe. to believe myself too. Yeah, but <laughs> but but uh, I mean, maybe I don't because the way that you stated the problem, everything made right. super duper perfect sense. I, I do think right. that sometimes when people state problems like this, they kind of want people to get the wrong answer just to you know right. explain the trickiness of it. So they they kind of hide that fact that Monty Hall will only ever open a door where the car is not there, right? And that does uh, change yeah. the problem. Yeah, it does uh, does change the problem. I mean, it's one thing I, I tell my students in a, uh, to, in probability or math in general, being really clear about what you're saying is very important. I, in fact, uh, yesterday I asked my class, I said, if you flip a coin a thousand times, what's the most likely number of heads you get? And two, is that a likely number of heads to get? And of course, 500 is the most likely number of heads. And no, it's not very likely that you're going to get 500 heads. That's but right. with regard to Monty, Monty Hall, there's um, what I try to do is you know uh, uh, show the relevance of puzzles, uh, the puzzles I do talk about to everyday life. So I imagine a, um, uh, a, a dual game in which instead of Monty Hall, there's this psychopath uh, uh, called Taunty Hall. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a guest, uh, and the same thing. The only thing is, if he picks the the door, the crucial door, there's not a car there. There's a, a little gun that shoots out a toxic mist of uh, gas and sickens the person choosing that door. So, again, the, the person picks a door. Let's say he picks door one. Taunty Hall always opens the door behind which he knows there's nothing. Let's say he opens three, and then he asks the guest, do you want to switch to door two? And uh, now he should say no, because for the same reason, he was right one-third of the time, two-thirds of the probability than the other two doors, but he wants to limit his exposure, so he should stick there. So it's a kind of dual problem. He should stick with what he picked. And, you know, uh, you know the relevance of that, let's say, to COVID is you want to limit the number of uh, people you come in contact with. I mean, there are versions of this with a hundred doors or whatever, right. but um, in any case. And did you, do I remember in the book you, you claim, I'm, I might be completely misremembering this, but people are better at getting that version of the problem right than the original Monty Hall problem? I, I think uh, they are. I mean, uh, maybe fear is, uh, induces one to think more clearly than <laughs> does uh Greed, I'm not sure. Although greed does a good job, too. <laughs> greed does a pretty good job, but I think it's actually, I mean, maybe it's just not about thinking clearly, right? You know, uh, I yeah. pretty firmly believe that the human brain was not evolved and optimized to do math problems, but there's sort of right. situations we find ourselves in that are analogous to math problems that we are, that our brain is pretty good at, and maybe being scared of something is closer to that instinctual correctness than uh, looking out for a reward. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, you, you don't know, uh, primitive man didn't need uh, probability to realize if there's a rustling in the bush to, to run. <laughs> and there, uh, even if it's, you'd be wrong a lot of the time. It, it's interesting because I've been thinking for various reasons, both teaching and research, about the arrow of time and the second law of thermodynamics recently. Yeah. And reading back in the history of it, or even hearing what modern physics professors tell their students, that there's this issue that came up in the 1870s about the number of ways a system can go from low entropy to high entropy versus the number it can go from high entropy to low entropy. And right. the, the answer is the num those two numbers have to be exactly the same because the underlying symm there's right. a symmetry of reversibility of the underlying system. And Schmidt famously made this objection to Boltzmann. But there's plenty of textbooks you can read that will tell you no, it's there's more ways to go from low entropy yeah. to high than high to low, and they're making the same mistake about conditional probabilities. I think they're they're conditionalizing on starting in low entropy, which is a big cheat. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that that's an interesting point. Yeah, that's that's true. Actually, I, there's one uh, kind of political instance of uh, thermodynamics, for lack of a better term, and, 
And that's uh, Baldini's principle that it's much, much easier, uh, it's sometimes called the bullshit principle, much easier to produce bullshit than it is to refute it. <laughs> and and Mark, Mark Twain had a similar comment. He, he said it's much easier to con people than it is to convince them they've been conned. Oh, yeah, so, right. People don't so want to believe he, that. Yeah, okay. I mean, so QAnon, conspiracy theorists, election deniers, I mean, once they publicly state the nonsense they believe, it's very hard to get them back. Well, you've talked in this book and elsewhere a lot about pseudoscience and conspiracy theories and, and so right. forth. What is the connection to numeracy or innumeracy there? Well, I think uh, it's uh, just clear thinking there in, in, in that case. I mean, uh, You've got to know some facts. You've got to know a modicum of uh, arithmetic probability. And if you don't, uh, you're more easily um, more easily fooled. I mean, I, the prosecutor's paradox uh, is relevant, uh, again, to, to uh, conditional probability. Uh, there's some crime and there's a lot of evidence and you, they arrest somebody. If that person's innocent... The probability of the evidence that he was around the, 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 the murder, he did have big shoes, he did, that, did talk to people around there. So the probability of that evidence, given he's innocent, is low. But that's not the relevant conditional probability. Right. The, the relevant conditional probability is the probability he's innocent, given the evidence. And the defense attorney will bring in all the other people who have these characteristics. And the probability of innocence, given... Evidence is much higher often than the probability of evidence given innocence, but it's very easy if people don't understand about conditional probability or just conditional statements that don't know the difference between if A then B and uh, if B then A, which is basically what conditional probability is. And this kind of feeds in with, in the case of the conspiracy theories, uh, some kind of wishful thinking, right? Or some kind of search for clarity in uh, a simple system that covers everything. And and so maybe this is a, an example where human psychology and bad math work hand in hand to lead people to wrong conclusions. Oh, that's definitely the case. In fact, cognitive foibles in general are a big part of uh, what leads people astray. And we're all uh, vulnerable to them. I mean, the anchoring effect, uh, Availability error, confirmation bias. One that doesn't get as much publicity is the conjunction fallacy. Uh -huh. You have somebody that says he's a senator, U.S. senator, and he's everybody, you know, he's very moderate, he's uh, intelligent. Uh, you know, rectitude is the word that comes to mind for everybody thinks of him. He lives modestly with uh, his wife and uh, his daughter, who's unfortunately very sick. But in any case, uh, given that background, what's more likely that this senator took a bribe from a lobbyist or that he took a bribe from a lobbyist and used the money to pay for his daughter's expensive operation? Right. <laughs> and most people say, well, or at least a lot of people, uh, probably the latter, given what she said about him. But it's more likely that he took money from a lobbyist, period, because it's always easier to satisfy one condition than two or more conditions. And uh, what that has to do with the uh, Internet and fake news is, given the Internet, uh, all kinds of odd facts, factoids, uh, the little details are available. So it's easy to kind of cobble together a superficially plausible story. And there's this trade-off between probability and plausibility. Mm. You add more details which you can glean from the internet, uh, your story becomes in a way more plausible, the same way this senator thing would work, but less probable. And, um, you know, if you're vulnerable, if you're gullible to begin with, and you have all these seemingly uh, precise details, you can fool people. And a lot of this, what we're talking about is, is not maybe what I would necessarily think of as a math in the traditional math curriculum, so, so much as just logic and, and clear thinking. Right. I mean, do, you, do you distinguish between these two things, or is it all one set of sensible thoughts to you? Uh, I guess uh, it is possible to distinguish. I mean, it is a matter of clear thinking. But yeah, there, there are other components. In fact, I mean, one thing I try to do in my writing is kind of, kind of set up a uh, uh, are links between stories and statistics or uh, narratives and numbers, whatever. Even in my first book, Math and Humor, I, I talked about the similarities between uh, 
jokes and and uh, and uh, <clears throat> philosophy and mathematics rather. There's both math and jokes depend on logic, although the logic might be perverted, the patterns might be different. Uh, but you use some of the same tools we do to ad absurdum uh, for different reasons. And humor and jokes is for the absurdum, and math is to disprove something. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but there is a kind of continuum, and in the, in the continuum between math and jokes is puzzles. They're, they're, they're more substantial than jokes, but they, they do share with math also this aha moment. And uh, so in essence, uh, puzzles are very mathematical and, uh, and whether they're mechanical puzzles like uh, Rubik's Cube and auto, or group theory and that, or, any, or verbal puzzles like uh, Monty Hall. So, uh, you know, there are similarities, but uh, I mean, there are, you know, so it is kind of a continuum. There's not a chasm between here's numbers and here's narratives. There's a connection. I mean, there's differences. One is that in mathematics or science, the logic is extensional. If you have a proof or something, every every time you have a three, you could put in square root of nine or cube root of 27. It doesn't make a difference. But you can't just, a woman can't just say, or a man can't just say, ah, oh, the happiest day of my life was the 80th anniversary of uh, 110th anniversary of Miller Fillmore's death. Even if that, <laughs> even if that was her wedding, that was day, the day. Yeah, <laughs> that was the day. But the, you, you know, are you crazy that the happy anniversary is 110th anniversary? So you you can't do that. And also, just the whole kind of psychological mom, mindset. And you know, when you do reading a story, science fiction, or whatever, just uh, for the enjoyment, you suspend disbelief. You have to go, okay, let's go with it. But in math or science or statistics, you do j just the opposite. You suspend belief, so you're not mm. bamboozled. You want to really prove it. So there are lots of differences, but uh, but still, uh, they're both human endeavors, and they're they're not uh, totally distinct things. Uh, storytelling and and theorem proving or number crunching. Well, you have the word narrative right there in the title of the new book. So it's clear that that, right. that you recognize that. And I guess it, it is interesting how human beings, we use math, but we love stories. I, I recently did a podcast with Peter Dodds, who is a statistician, complex system yeah. theorists, uh, who, who made a quote that I will never stop quoting, which is, never bring statistics to a story fight. <laughs> <laughs> People Actually, love that their stories. Yeah. And, and I guess maybe, I don't know how it, it, you know intentional it is or it just seemed to be the best way to do it, but what you're doing in your books is telling people math and helping them learn math through the device of fun little stories. Uh, exactly. I like to use uh, jokes, puzzles, anecdotes, uh, little vignettes, uh, and you can often get the, the, the math across without uh, rousing people's kind of, too many people's uh, innate uh, if not fear, discomfort with numbers or fear they're going to be judged. But you get the same idea across without the formalism. I mean, there's a limit to it, you can't, but, uh, but you can get a, a good deal of mathematics across with, um, with stories. In fact, uh, I, one of my books, I think, Therefore I Laugh, I, I, it was based or uh, was inspired by a, a quote by Wittgenstein who said you could write a good and serious book in philosophy that consisted entirely of jokes, <laughs> where, joke is, where joke is interpreted very loosely. Very loosely. You get the joke, you get the relevant philosophical point. And uh, so the conceit in the book is, you know, here's a collection of stories, jokes, anecdotes that uh, get points across. Well, I, I'll confess I have not actually read your books that discuss math and humor, but I, I, now that you brought up the idea. I'm fascinated by the concept of a continuum between math and jokes. <laughs> and and it, it does make sense that there's this aha moment, right? I mean, a, a joke is somehow confounding our expectations somehow, and a math puzzle is somehow resisting immediate analysis. Uh, ha, has there been, I don't know, academic work on the relationship between these two things? Uh, not too much. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of journals of humor that kind of touch on it. But uh, I mean, I think that's one of the appeal of uh, counterintuitive results in math. They're kind of like jokes, like, what? You can't do that? Uh, it's continuous, <laughs> but not differentiable. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And so I, I uh, 
even even in this book, I bring up some philosophical issues uh, about uh, Eugene Wigner and the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Uh, narratives is a collection of metaphors. Um, uh, justified true belief is not equally knowledge. Hmm. And, um, so, I can tell that you had some philosophical background as well as the usual mathematical background. Yeah, as an undergraduate, I skipped around. I majored for a while in philosophy and in English and physics. I kept coming back to math, but uh, I always wanted to write. So, in a sense, I, I do both. <laughs> got the right, got the exactly the right thing. So, the, a lot of the examples we've been talking about here are either logic or probability. Um, there's a lot more to math than that, obviously. I mean, right. if, if you were put in charge, if you were the emperor of math education now, what, what is it that you would say people should learn? What, what is the minimum basic knowledge of math that one has to be numerate? Well, facility with arithmetic, first of all, and, um, and uh, of course, probability and, uh, and uh, logic. And notions in the philosophy of science, I mean, just uh, everyday notions like what's a placebo, what's a double blind study, mm. uh, which, you know, most people are innocent of. In fact, I just wrote a piece for three parts daily about uh, uh, <clears throat> why, uh, quizzes for congressional aspirants. I mean, at any time you apply for a job, especially a high tech job, you you are interviewed and they give you some problems. So can you program this in Python or whatever? But yet you can run for, uh, you know, Congress, uh, you can run for president, and, uh, you know, you, there's no such uh, uh, test. And uh, perhaps uh, there should be, although you'd have to drag in people into it or sh shame them into it. But you wouldn't have Herschel Walker saying, you know, <laughs> you know why are we making clean air? We just send it to China, and they send us the dirty air, and, uh, and evolution's a hoax. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. I do want to. I want to, um, you know, note your your mention of Three Quarks Daily. That's one of our favorite websites here at the Mindscape Podcast. So I'm glad that you put in a plug for that. Oh yeah, no, I I, I enjoy it as well. But in fact, I, I write a kind of semi regular column for them. But but let's take seriously this somewhat provocative idea that we should have standards for politicians or leaders or, or something like that. Um, and we should have standards, but it's very hard to get it right. I mean, we for right. various reasons in, in my Ask Me Anything episodes of the podcast, I recently revealed my uh, love as a, as a high school kid for reading Robert Heinlein novels. And Heinlein once said that, you know, you shouldn't be allowed to vote if you can't solve a quadratic equation. And yeah. that it seems a bit extreme to me. Like I, I mean, I, I, yeah. I understand no, I, I the the motivation, <laughs> but uh, should should politicians be allowed to run for office if they can't solve a quadratic equation? Uh yeah, I, I think that's a bad example. But uh, being <laughs> able to uh, having some feel for like scaling, like you can't scale up things. Like every time I go to a movie, I'm always amazed you can get a uh, you know a soda that's eight inches high or ten inches high and the, 10 inch high one is uh, 50 cents more than the 8 inch high one, even though it's probably, uh, you know, much, uh, much, the volume is much greater or ordering a pizza. So, I mean, scale of people don't realize that things scale up uh, with squares or cubes, uh, geometric things, but even, uh, you know, size of cities scale up uh, in, uh, with the fractional exponent, uh, Joffrey West, uh, West uh, mm -hmm. talked about that. I talked about that. So it's, um, it's a kind of basic notion uh, that uh, I think some people should have some idea about <laughs> as, as well as uh, being able to estimate things. Uh, I mean, just a very rough estimate. You get tell somebody uh, Empire State Building is two, mile high, two miles high, you don't have to know the exact height. It happens to be 1,776 feet. But uh, two miles high, do you really realize that? I mean, so some, <laughs> some appreciation for normal, uh, you know, estimates. I mean, even if you ask people, um, you know, there's a study that's done that that 42 percent of heart attacks occur on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And people attribute this to heavy drinking and uh, mm. partying. So and, you know, I can see people saying, wow, I'm, I better be careful. Uh, but. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is three-sevenths of a week, which is 43%. So, um, 
I mean, the same thing, a four-day holiday weekend, 400 people are going to die. 35,000 or more a year do die on the highway. So it's a normal four days. It's not, but, uh, so there's some feeling for relevant magnitudes, for, for um, scaling, for estimating, for sequencing, some things you have to do in a certain order. Right. There are lots of little puzzles all like that. And uh, those don't involve quadratic e equations, uh, which, you know, I don't think that would be a reasonable requirement. No, it's just memorizing a formula. Yeah, I, I do get that. But it, it's interesting because all the examples you're giving um, are a little bit different than what we actually teach people in high school, right? Or even in college. Right. Like we take geometry and trigonometry, maybe calculus. And, and I love all these subjects dearly. But as far as I know, at least when I was in high school, we didn't take probability, statistics, scaling, estimates, uh, any anything like that. Are you are you implicitly suggesting a radical revision of the secondary school math curriculum? Uh, well, I mean, it's hard to generalize because some schools, I think, uh, do, and the, the best schools do. But uh, uh, I don't know about a radical revision, but certainly an addition of uh, such topics uh, that. Uh, that are most relevant to uh, politics, popular culture, and everyday life. I, I think, you know, scaling, as I said, uh, uh, estimation and so on. And, and just an ability to kind of think outside the box. One thing I, 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 I talk about in an argument, uh, uh, a pro uh, or anti-abortionist, anti, anti that... Uh, is you know is is kind of fanciful, but it, it, uh, it is interesting. The people who are absolute, uh, super absolutists with regard to banning abortion, I think that you could it would be useful to kind of uh, get them to admit that in certain cases, I'm not talking about right, rape or incest, but in certain regular cases, they should have abortion should be there. And there's a, a story I like that I prefaced the uh, abortion story with about. George Bernard Shaw, supposedly, and again, the story might be apocryphal, he's sitting next to a woman at this posh dinner party, and he said, would you sleep with me for a million pounds? And she says, uh, yes, I will, and she laughs and giggles, and then she's, then he said, would you sleep with me for 10 pounds? And she says, no, what do you, who do you think I am? And he says, well, we already established that, now we're just haggling about the details. <laughs> but, you know, it's a... Uh, Stupid story, sexist story, but it's relevant uh, to uh, this argument I'm going to make. Imagine uh, that um, because of some cosmic catastrophe or toxins in the environment or whatever, that women who became pregnant became pregnant with 10 to 20 fetuses. That's one assumption. And two, uh, imagine that advances in, uh, in uh, technology and uh, Birth uh, procedures and neonatal technology uh, enabled uh, doctors to uh, save some or all of the fetuses if they inter intervene in the first three months. So uh, if that's the case, uh, what would uh, people who are absolutist opponents of abortion do uh, if uh, people got the woman got pregnant with 10 or 20 fetuses? They can't just say, well, we'll take some of them and let the other ones go, because that's tantamount to abortion. And uh, so they'd have to, uh, to be re maintain their position, they'd have to uh, accept a 10 to 20-fold increase in uh, birth rates, which I think they wouldn't do. And um, so, again, just to get away from the absolutist position and uh, the relevance of that to the uh, so he, uh George Bernard Shaw's story is once you get them off of this totally absolutist position, mm. then the rest is haggling about the details. You go for 15 weeks or 20 weeks or whatever. So um, in any case. I think, yeah, the, the, the concept that the kinds of math that we teach people in high school or whatever, I, I really think that's something we should take much more seriously. You know, I... I Myself, when it comes to science, often complain that we teach science as a list of facts, right? A list of true yeah. things rather than as the process, the empirical right. hypothesis testing process, which is much more central to it. And people come out not really understanding what to do with 
news stories about science in the media. And I guess uh, probably the same thing is true with math also, that there's a different kind of math that is equally good that would be way more relevant to people's reasoning in everyday circumstances. Yeah, I think that's true, except uh, in in the case of physics or science in general, those stories do make it into popular press, whereas there's very rare that any breakthrough in uh, or big result in mathematics will be written about. Uh, But uh, no, but uh, I I agree. But I I think it should be part of a a general, I mean, general knowledge is is important as well. And... uh, and it's, it's, you know, and uh, teaching, wariness, skepticism, uh, suspending belief and so on is, is important. And it's connected to a lot of things. I mean, uh, I, it's interesting. I, I write about uh, people who are most uh, pro-free enterprise have no problem uh, accepting the complexity of an economy. And they don't say, wow, how did it come into being all of a sudden? But it does. You can go to any store in the country, any convenience store, and you can get a Snickers bar or a half a gallon of milk. And you can get any kind of clothes or shoes anywhere you want. And nobody said, how did this come into, into being immediately? But yet they make this, some people make the intelligent design people, so-called, make the same, make the comparable argument. They look at it, came, how did life come into, into being so immediately? How did this eye come into being? Instead of saying, well, it, to use the, 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 the verboten word, it evolved the same way <laughs> cities, <laughs> cities and economy evolved. But they uh, are most accepting of capitalism and, and, which, and least accepting of the analogous process when it comes to life. And uh, so. Yeah, I mean, this is, I guess this is a common theme of, of what you're saying. Is it's not just clear thinking, but a consistency of thinking across domains. And yeah. pe- people always talk about we should teach critical thinking or something like that. Yeah. And I, I, I actually I don't know whether or not that makes sense. Is that something that can be taught in your experience? Uh, to some extent. I mean, they're, 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 it does so often devolve into something kind of silly. But, uh, I mean, I think uh, getting people to know a lot, <laughs> not just facts, but uh, trends and connections between disparate fields like uh, you know, uh, econ- economics and, uh, and uh, evolution is, I mean, if you, if you know something, you know, not a lot necessarily, I mean, it helps if you know a lot, but uh, you know something and, and are taught to bring, bring things together to try to relate uh, have a kind of more holistic uh, attitude towards knowledge. I think that's a, that's a worth worthwhile endeavor. But it, it, you're right. I mean, it, it's hard. I'm not sure how how you go about teaching critical thinking because people always are drawing me on to some fact, the key, you know, the key formula, the key thing. Yeah. And um, often there is no clear thing. Well, and often <laughs> it's a sort of against their interests, right? People don't want to reach certain conclusions and the human brain is really, really good at reaching the conclusions we want to reach, not the ones that the data are forcing us to go toward. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, I, I talk a lot about logical logic in, in the book and the paradoxes and, uh, and uh, their relevance to everyday life. I mean, I mean, even in the stock market, uh, it, there's, the efficient market hypothesis says that you know information about a stock is immediately available to mm. everybody, and, but it, it it most markets aren't all that efficient. But it, it's you can it have a, create a kind of relevant example, a, a relevant uh, something that's relevant to the uh, liars paradox. The efficient market hypothesis is true to the effect that most people think it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Because if most people think it's not true, uh, then they'll say, "Oh, and there, you know, there's a, a, a way I can make more money," and they'll, uh, they'll they'll do all kinds of contortions, research that, and by doing that, they'll make it efficient. And if they already think it's efficient, uh, then it's, what's the worth? What's the what's the worth of doing that? That's every information, every bit of information is already priced in. Or what do I want to yeah. do that for? So. Um, a lot of these paradoxes uh, are relevant to broader themes. And again, that, to your point, that, that's generally not taught in a math class. It's hard there in any class. So 
you kind of have to come upon it yourself or or uh, whatever. Or, or read who's counting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Read who's counting. Uh, speaking of which, this is a perfect segue because I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, you have the new book out. I have a new book that, that recently came out that also... Uh, well, it, it, I wanted to contrast it a little bit because my in my new book, The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, uh, I try to teach people the basics of classical physics, the difference being from other books that I do the math, that I show them all the equations. There's over 100 equations in the book, all the way up to Einstein's equation. And w so one of the angles I try out when I come across a skeptic is who says, you know, I just don't understand equations. I will never be able to understand it. And I say, look, you understand two plus two equals four. That's an equation, right? And it's a matter of degree, not of kind, to understand Einstein's equation. It's just a little bit more complicated. There's no such thing as people who can't understand equations. It's yeah. just, you know, are you willing to do a little bit more work than you usually do? So what do you think of that, <laughs> of that angle? Is that a plausible story? I, th I think so. I, I think, uh, you know, Stephen Hawking allegedly uh, uh, said that... Uh, if you put an equation in your book, you cut the readership by a, by a, uh, a half. So if you put a hundred <laughs> equations, very very in tiny. Book, <laughs> but I think that's false. I mean, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, you just have to have to do it uh, carefully. I mean, you have to embed the equation in a, in a discussion in which it makes sense. Uh, you can't just baldly say, you know, "Here's the here's the formulas." But uh, I, I, mean, I think that's, you know, that's, you know, so I, I think that's a good idea. If you, I, I'm sure you did. Uh, yeah, I, I've read some of your stuff. You, you do write very well, and it is embedded in a context that gives it meaning. Well, we tried, but I'm, I'm wondering about the level of abstraction, right? I mean, now that I've done this experiment, I'm curious to see whether people enjoy it or not. But when you talk about Einstein's equation for general relativity, you know, not E equals MC squared, but R mu nu minus yeah. one half R G mu nu, yeah. uh, that is, there's some journey that the learner oh, has yeah. to go on to, to really wrap their heads around it. And and I'm just, I'm, I'm wondering if it is really something that, you know, some people just aren't going to do or aren't willing to do, or is it, could we teach everybody Einstein's equation and that those other kinds of higher math that we're certainly not going to do in yeah. high school? I think uh, you could reach a lot of people. I, I, I wouldn't say everybody, but uh, you, you could reach many more people than I reach now because uh, if, it, if it was uh, done right. Yeah, but, give them the uh, opportunity. Yeah, given the opportunity, requiring your book. <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> Fishing for that one, but yes. But I mean, uh, actually, well, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say. I mean, two and two equals four is always put forth as a kind of standard, uh, simple fact. But uh, uh, but everything is depends on context. I mean, it's not always the case. If you take uh, two cups of popcorn and add two cups of water to it, you get three cups of soggy popcorn, not, not four. So, and that's, I mean, so any bit of mathematics can be misapplied. I and mean, there's a story of the, the uh, bear hunters who became extinct shortly after they mastered vector analysis. Because before they had mastered the vec vector analysis, when they saw a bear to the Northwest, they shot it. But now that they know vector analysis, they see a bear to the northwest, they shoot one arrow to the north and one arrow to the west, and the bear gets away. <laughs> <laughs> so in math, like uh, adding integers and simple vector analysis, this silliness is, is, is uh, clear as apparent. But if you get into more complex mathematics, you can say something right. equally stupid, and um, and uh, but it goes by. It's a very easy... Uh, to intimidate people, if you if you're a mathematician or a physicist, uh, because people aren't going to challenge you, you can say the most uh, abstruse sounding nonsense. Well, this and, is the uh, famous uh, anxiety people have when they take math classes about word problems, right? Like yeah, you can yeah. memorize how to manipulate the equations and maybe get the right answer, but if you need to translate from words into equations, that's harder. But in some sense, that's by far the more important yeah, skill, yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> That goes back to my narrative numbers continuum. Yeah. So uh, there, <clears throat> that is by far more important. And, uh, 
You mentioned already uh, the phrase, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. And of the, course, the, the, what? the, unre the unreasonable oh, yeah, effectiveness yeah, yeah. of mathematics yeah. and physics, which is a famous phrase from Eugene Wigner, oh, uh, yeah. which, by the way, I'm a little skeptical that it's true, that it's unreasonably yeah. effective. I, I kind of think that no matter what physics turned out to be, we would find math for it after the fact. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, the, right. I, I'm, I'm very skeptical of it because we learn about numbers by playing with little pebbles and putting them together. You take this one and that one, that's addition. Learn about geometry by looking at uh, uh, little twigs and uh, extending them and making little triangles of them. And uh, also we learn about physics by our working through the, walking through the world. So mathematics is kind of an idealization and abstraction of everyday things mm. that, that we do. So I, I I don't think it's all that unreasonable. If you abstract, if you idealize what you do when you're playing with pebbles and twigs and uh, and moving around, it's not surprising you get a mathematics that's going to be effective. It grew out of things that that, that work. But there then there are some. That's a great. That's another great segue because. I, I've been recently thinking, in part because I had a podcast interview with Justin Clark Doan, who is a philosopher of mathematics. So I've been thinking about the foundations of mathematics and mathematical logic. And it is the part of math that oh. I understand the least. I, I really, really struggle with. Like, geometry and topology I can do. But when you get into proving relationships between models and axiom systems and things like that, I, I, I just really, really struggle with it. But am I correct? That that's part of that was part of your uh, mathematical research. Yeah, yeah. I uh, my degree was in PhD in mathematics, but I was most interested in my thesis and papers were in logic and model theory and uh, non-standard logics. And uh, yeah, I was interested, as I said, as an undergraduate in philosophy, and, that, and that's still kind of mathematics that I'm, you know, more, at least initially was most interested in. And uh, I, I talk about Gödel's theorem, but an non-standard proof of it, using ideas from complexity theory, Greg, uh, Greg Chapin. And um, yeah, so I, I think uh, <clears throat> a little bit of um, some logic doesn't have to be, you know, go too far, but um, people don't know the difference between, uh, you know, affirming a consequent and all these Latin terms. Sure. And uh, I think they... they Sure, they don't have. They probably just focus on memorizing the terms instead of understanding them. But can you say more about proving Gödel's theorem using complexity theory? <laughs> yeah, a, a sequence is uh, is random if the the shortest program that generates it is about as as long as as the sequence itself. And it's not random if you can generate, uh, I mean, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, you can generate that by just saying zero, one, repeated right. you know, a thousand times. But uh, I, 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 you can never generate something more complex than the generating algorithm. And uh, so it uses that and varies paradox to show that, uh, you know, you can't, to speak loosely, you can't generate 10 pounds of theorems from five pounds of axioms. There's always going to be theorems or statements that you're not going to be able to prove right? because of the limited complexity of any logical system. Uh, a nice example that's kind of silly, but I like uh, uh, Barry's paradox says uh, you're in an elevator, you're very short, the building is very tall, press the first button that you can't reach. <laughs> By definition, you can't, you can't reach it. Right. So it's um, you know I sketch a little bit more than that, but uh, I, I like the the uh, Chapin proof of Gödel's theorem uh, better because it, it it it's connected to a more basic stuff about the notion of complexity. Complexity is something that's in the world and is an important topic in computer science, and uh, from it follows uh, Gödel incompleteness theorem without going through and looking at Gödel numberings and so on. No, that's that's fascinating. I, I didn't really uh, know about it. So just to make sure I get it right, I mean, Gödel's theorem is saying that if you have a system that you assume is consistent, which you can't prove, right? right? But if you assume it's consistent, there's roughly speaking going to always be statements that are true but unprovable in that system. Yeah, that would be neither you know neither provable nor disprovable. Right, right. It's, it's just undecided. And 
Undecidable, exactly. And so what you're saying is that that kind of follows from a counting argument that you, you can just yeah. imagine that there's, I don't quite see the argument, but I get that it, that it could be there, that uh, given a finite axiomatic system, you can only reach so many provable statements and there's a lot more out there that are neither provable nor disprovable. Right, that are beyond our R or the system's complexity horizon. And is that kind of higher level abstract mathematics also useful to people on the street, is, you know, beyond conditional probabilities and things like that? Are these sort of wilder realms of mathematics uh, also rewarding? Uh, rewarding, but uh, I'm not sure it'd be useful to too many people on the street. They'd have to have a kind of theoretical bent, I guess. But computer science is, is uh, you know, a big part of it is about... Uh, you know, uh, classifying sets uh, according to their complexity and uh, uh, getting algorithms that are harder and harder to break, that not necessarily uh, and quantum uh, uh, algorithms, but the, the regular ones involving, you know, prime numbers and simple facts about the you know, number theory. Right. But uh, so in that sense, I mean, they're important. I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, G.H. Hardy, a mathematician, I once wrote a book called The Mathematician's Apology. In which case he uh, says he only pure math and only number theory, pure number <laughs> theory is the only thing that's that's worth our reverence. And he uh, you know, applied mathematics; he acted like it was pornography or something. But actually, somebody once wrote a, a review of his book, a one a one sentence review of G.H. Uh, Hardy's uh, apology, and he said uh, the world sickens from such cloistered clowning. <laughs> <laughs> it, but the funny thing is that number theory, uh, which she thought was so pure, I mean, you couldn't uh, carry on a modern economy without being able to transfer trillions of dollars over oceans and around the world instantaneously. So th this, um, so even number theory was uh, is very applied. You can't tell what's applied. Uh, and the same thing in relativity and Minkowski, Riemann, and so sure. on. They, they, they weren't talking about physics, but uh, they constructed the tools. It's also fascinating to me how people get worked up about these mathematical issues. I was, I was just reading um, a little bit about Georg Contour and his proof of the different yeah. kinds of infinity and right. how, Leo, I guess, Leopold Kronecker really yeah, right. gave him a hard time, like really just tried to ruin his career because he had proven that there were different kinds of infinity. Yeah, yeah right. Uh, he, he, you know, there's only the integers and everything else is uh, yeah uh, it's made up I kind <laughs> of I, I've been wondering again for for research level reasons do we really need infinity or do we really need a continuous infinity or could we just imagine that reality just works on either a finite or at least a countable set of things and uh -huh. and, and we're sort of kind of just amusing ourselves, but not really making productive understanding of the universe by thinking about all of these more difficult levels of infinity? That's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, it's a very beautiful subject, uh, transfinite arithmetic and transfinite set theory in general. But um, I, I don't know. If, uh... By the way, one thing about Kronecker, he said only the integers exist, but there's you know lots of connections between the two. But one that I find... I'm discussing a book about is the, the number e 2.718 and so on, uh -huh. which is plays a big role in math, finance, everything else, all kinds of instances. But this one I like. You tell people to look at their computer or phone and randomly pick a real number between zero and a thousand. Okay, you have to pick rational if you're doing it with a computer, but still, it's close enough. So pick a real number between zero and a thousand. Then keep on doing that until the sum of the real numbers you've picked is over 1,000. Okay. So I might, I might pick 502, 308, uh, 607. The third number would be over. So if you have a whole, you know, many, many people or do this or you do it yourself many, many times, the average number of numbers you have to choose before you get a sum over 1,000 is E. <laughs> <laughs> which seems boy, really that seems weird uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so that's weird. I mean, there is so Chronicle was even his uh, beloved just integers, positive integers, gives rise to the number E, which is irrational, transcendental, and so on. It is, yeah, I, I, I get that it's hard to get around the appearance of these numbers. You know, one of my favorite blog posts I ever wrote was on Pi Day, you know, Pi Day, March 14th, yeah, right. which is also Einstein's birthday. And so I wrote about the fact that in Einstein's equation that we were just talking about, the one for general yeah. relativity, the right-hand side is 8 pi g t mu nu. And so pi appears there in the in the equation for gravity. Yeah. And why is that? And, you know, it, it's a very interesting story having to do with the fact that spheres have pi in them when you calculate the area of a sphere. And, yeah. and Isaac Newton gave us a law for forces rather than for fields. So... Uh, all these numbers are there, and yeah, maybe maybe that's a good reason not to try to discretize the world too much. <laughs> yeah, no, I think you can. I mean, actually, you look at uh, Ramanujan, the famous Indian mathematician who died early. He has he came up with all sorts of crazy identities that that involve pi and e and infinite sums, and uh, and you say, how did he ever come to that? And uh, yeah, he did. Nobody. I mean, that. that uh, G. H. Hardy writes about him. He said he was the only, I'm paraphrasing it, but the only person he ever loved, uh, platonically, is, uh, well, for him it would be, uh, was Ramanujan. I mean, it, he just fell in love with the, you know, the amazing kind of uh, resonance that Ramanujan had with the mathematical universe. Yeah, Ramanujan is, is a great example almost as a counterexample, but as, as a version of this this idea that I like to, to mention that the human brain is not meant to do math. Uh, we have to train ourselves, right? You know, we're meant yeah, to make yeah. rough and ready things, rough and ready estimates, but not so much more precise calculations. But not all brains are equal at it. And, and he is an example of someone who really did, in a way that no one understands, seem to just see things out there in the world of, of the natural numbers and the and continued fractions and things like that that, that were pretty yeah. amazing. It is. And in and to this day, incomprehensible. Like, how did he come to that? Yeah. <laughs> and, and often he, he didn't he didn't necessarily believe in proofs. I mean, Hardy had a, he came from India and Hardy gave him some conventional mathematics that would reprove things. And he often just, intuited it in some sense and uh, so a lot of his amazing results are just statements and then people uh, mathematicians work feverishly and say, oh yeah I proved it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you wonder do you have feelings about the future of artificial intelligence as mathematical proof generator could we could we get a lot more proofs for theorems once the AIs really get good at it I think so yeah I it, it's hard to make uh, predictions but uh yeah, I, I, I think so. And not just mathematics. I mean, everyday uh, life, everyday humans sometimes, I fear. <laughs> mm. And I, I do want to give you a chance to, there was one little piece of advanced math that appeared in the book that I thought was very amusing, and I would like to understand better myself. So, you know, it's getting late in the podcast. We can, we can indulge ourselves a little bit, which is Ramsey theory. You use it as an example of how com complexity appears in unexpected places. So I'll give you a chance to explain that a little bit. Now, Ramsey theory is just the idea that with a big enough set and a big enough number of connections among the elements, you're going to have necessarily have some bit of order. The order is going to going to be there. If you if you have six six points uh, and you connect them with with lines, six nodes, you connect them with lines. There's necessarily going to be uh, some of them with blue lines, some of them with red lines. There's necessarily going to be a triangle where all three are the same. And results of that sort, and uh, with bigger sets, you need uh, you need a much bigger set to have you know more order. But the, it's impossible to to uh, not have any bit of order. Um, and in fact, I mean, in general, that's an idea I've always liked that uh, the uh, the impossibility of total disorder. Mm. Because if you if you have total disorder uh, on a higher level, in a sense. There was order. I mean, that's uh, statistical mechanics. I mean, disorder, and then at the higher level, you get uh, that you get a definition of temperature, which is more macro. And and there are other elements like Kaufman. You connect uh, light bulbs in some random way. 
on and off. And if we have some rule, if two of the three inputs are on, it'll go on or off. And no matter how uh, kind of random you make the rules, after a while you get some pattern that keeps <laughs> appearing. And I mean, it's, it's a, <clears throat> like a game of, of, of life. I mean, you get uh, these random things become computers and wolf rams uh, work and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, Conway's uh, life, uh, life game and so on. So uh, order arises no matter what, which I find an intriguing kind of uh, result in a kind of generalized sort of way. Yeah, I, I'll confess I don't completely understand it myself. I would love to understand this better because I do know there are these examples which are very provocative, like like you just said, of uh, orderliness emerging. Emergent is the word that I would that I would like to right, use yeah, out of right. the underlying yeah. lack of yeah. order. But I don't understand how robust it is. Is it inevitable? Does it always happen, or are we cherry picking examples where it happens? And I'm just not really sure. I, I think. You know, again, I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but I, I think it always happens. It just uh, mm. maybe it takes takes longer in some cases, but um, which is kind of a neat result in a way. Oh, it's I mean, very, very important if it's true. Yeah, that's why I don't know. It would be nice to have a. I don't know. There's probably other people who do know much more than I do about that, but yeah, yeah. But okay, so good. We've, we've indulged ourselves with a little bit of uh, oh, oh, less yeah. practical mathematical speculation. But to bring it back to, to, to close things up, um, you know, you've done an enormous amount for spreading the word of mathematics, as it were, to a, a broad set of people. And I'm sure in various ways, large and small, you've gotten pushback about is this elitist? Is it paternalistic? You know, are you just getting annoying people for letting them, uh, for making them not just get on with their lives and thinking about all this abstract stuff? So how do we get people excited and interested and educated about math in a way that doesn't come across as elitist and paternalistic? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think uh, elitism is part of it. I, I don't see why here's some interesting stuff it's relevant to some stuff you might be interested in here's how it works why that's um, viewed as elitist i mean of course uh, it it is by a lot of people i mean one of the uh, one of the reasons for uh, trump i mean resentment drives a lot of his his base uh but i don't i don't buy it i mean just because somebody feels that that, that but you know, presenting mathematics, presenting physics, presenting history, I mean, looking at something seriously, trying to understand it, relating it to other things, I, I, that's not elitist, that, that's human. Well, and, and maybe not to present this as a leading answer, but I think that being human, being warm, being engaging, being likable is, is probably goes a longer way toward making the math uh, palatable than we want right. to admit. It's not all just about the math. We're still human beings at the end of the day. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, if you are a you know, very dour look on your face and you hit your student uh, on the knuckles with a ruler <laughs> <laughs> and tell them to go sit in the corner with a dunce cap, yeah, you're not, that, that's not a way to get them to uh, appreciate or love mathematics, physics, history. I mean, but yeah, you're right. I, I mean, I think it's it's easier to learn from a, from a professor or from anybody if you, in a sense, like them uh, or can kind of map yourself onto them in some way. Uh, I mean, if the person who's enlightening you, to use that term, is kind of repellent, uh, you're not going to want to learn much from that person. You, you did mention in passing um, that big stories in physics get more play in the news or in science than big stories in math do. Yeah. Uh, do you think that's changing? Do you think that there's more and better math outreach and, and uh, public engagement today than there was 50 years ago? I think there is, but uh, and science is something that people understand. I mean, they don't understand the details, but they know that the moon's up there and uh, and the universe is expanding, and light goes this fast, and uh, and you know, and even just uh, speculative theories, uh, multiverse, and so on. Uh, that's something that engages people's uh, uh, imagination, and so uh, there can be more stories about uh, 
advances in physics or science or biology as well. Whereas math, I mean, you get a, a new result and a new, a new consequence of the axiom of choice or, or, <laughs> uh, or Bonnock's theorem. You can take a part of the sphere and put it together and make it twice as large. Right. I mean, it, it strikes people as just, you know, that's just hocus pocus. That's, you know, mathematicians, you know, whatever. So, I mean, they're, they're, but, but uh, as far as uh, outreach in general, I mean, I think STEM is more widely uh, uh, understood is what is why it's important and uh, again it's hard to generalize about uh, pedagogy but more more places uh, do a good job even though uh, there's still a vast number of people who are enumerate for lack of a better term but there is no better term <laughs> there's no better term and there's yeah. no better person who's done more to combat it than you have so john allen polos thanks very much for being on the mindscape podcast uh, thanks very much sean i truly really enjoyed it